and we're rolling. So welcome everyone to our webinar this evening. So glad that you could join us as we talk about climate change solutions and actions that we can take in the coming days, weeks, and months. But we're focused on the next few years of solving the 2030. So a few housekeeping notes. I'm sure you're We've got some people who are joining us who are not in attendance. So let me just take a moment and run through some of our participants and exercise my ability to mute some of you. But welcome aboard. We're glad to have you. And we're going to go through how our site works to make it a little bit easier for you all to participate and let us know what you're thinking. Just do a little check here of the muting. Sounds good. So we're going to move on to some housekeeping notes and some other welcome messages. Well, for those of you who would like to optimize your screen viewing, I'm going to show you the next slide, which is going to show you where that functionality is, where you can change how you see the screen. And as you can see here, your toolbar in WebEx looks just like this at the bottom. And how you mute your audio and video are these two buttons on the left hand side of your menu. And when they're red, you're muted. And that's what we'd like to see. Not that we don't want to hear from you, but we need to hear from our presenters this evening. And if you would like to let us know what you're thinking, we want you to use the chat function. So you can see I've highlighted that right here. And so you can just click on that round icon. And you can pose questions, you can help us figure out what our three top solutions are for the state of Florida to solve climate by 2030, or anything else that you'd like to post. We'll also be putting additional information in the chat function for you, so you can have links to events and other information. And if all of that technology is too difficult and you do want to connect with us, our information is available throughout the presentation, so don't hesitate to do that as well. And also, we will be having a Q&A at the end, so we want you to pose questions for our panelists. And my trusty assistant, aka my husband, who's sitting right next to me here, will be collating those questions. So when we get to that period, we will get questions, either general ones, or if you have a specific one, let us know which panelist you would like to ask that question of. And that's our housekeeping. Let me show you the view function. Actually, right here on the upper right hand side of your screen, you'll see you have a little menu bar. And if you do the side by side view, we feel like that optimizes your viewing. But it's up to you how you'd like to view the webinar this evening. So you can play around with that. I mostly want to make sure that you know where your chat function is so you can talk to us and give us your questions and your mute buttons. That's the most important that we need to see here tonight. All right, so moving on, let's talk a little bit about why we're all here this evening. So this is a really exciting monumental evening where all 50 states in the U.S. are participating in a dialogue at once, and I'll show you some of the other countries that are joining us, too. But I do want to give a shout out to some of our hosts. The University of South Florida is hosting this webinar, and we have the Clio Institute, who's provided much support for tonight, in addition to our climate. And we also want to be articulating with powerful movements right now, like the UN 75 and beyond. The U United Nations is turning 75. So that means it gets to shop at 7 a.m. at the food store and get its toilet paper. But we really want to connect with the Earth Day Network and with the UN. And we'll hear some more about that in a few minutes. Cliff Bar sent us 100 Cliff Bars to distribute during our grand live event this evening, which of course we are not having. So we promptly had those bars donated to our feedable pantry as it's so important right now to feed those who do not have in these troubled times. So here you can see some of the other universities and organizations who are sponsoring the webinar in their home states tonight. So I think we're a pretty good company here. If you take a look at that list, and also wanted to mention 
that we have other countries joining us tonight too, and Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico. And all of the webinars are being recorded. So if you're with us now and you're from another state, you can watch that webinar tomorrow. So that's how it's structured. So it's a very exciting time period for us. And here's the run through of what we'll be doing tonight. My name is Dr. Brooke Hansen. I'm the director of the Sustainable Tourism Program at the University of South Florida's Patel College of Global Sustainability. The college has nine different concentrations and we focus on sustainability every day, all the time for an all master's program. So do get in touch if you'd like some more information. And we'll start our evening tonight with Dr. Peter Styling is the director of the Office of Sustainability at USF, talking about UN 75 and our commitment to all working together to solve climate by 2030. And then we'll be joined by our panelists who will also give us their expertise. It's very insightful um, issues and questions to we can come up with our three big goals for Florida distracted over here. We had a couple of people who joined us who aren't muted, so I need to take a moment here and do some of my housekeeping and just make sure people stay muted so we can stay focused on the presentations. Okay, I think we're good again. You can see our schedule over here on the right. We'll try to stick to it. We can have our panelists and have time for a question and answer at the end and some closing remarks. We'll have some introduction of our panelists in a few minutes. So some of the outcomes of our webinar tonight and the countrywide and worldwide webinars are to think about what can we do on the personal level, the local level, the regional level, the municipal level, the national level, and the international level. Find one of those levels or multiple levels and see how you can articulate with this movement. Maybe it's just the personal level and that's great. And Yoka's going to give you some good pointers later on how you can do actions every day to help solve climate. The main organizers for this event would like us to come up with three big solutions in caps, what we can do in the state of Florida to solve climate by 2030, if not before. So that's why I want you to take advantage of the chat function. And if you have a solution or two or three, be writing it in there because we're going to collect all of those at the end. And we'll be sharing those nationally. There are so many resources I could share with you. I just pulled a few out. Tomorrow night, we have Susan Glickman, who's the Florida Director for the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. She'll be doing a webinar hosted by my college. And hopefully about right now in the chat function, you'll be seeing a link to that, but if you don't, you can always contact us later. I just need to do a little housekeeping again here just to make sure people are muted because we hear a little background noise. So just getting that done. Hi, Sarah, glad you're with us. See some great people who have joined us who have a lot of expertise here. So we're in good company tonight. I'm a member of the U.S. Green Building Council, Governing Council for Tampa Bay, and we were just discussing this other event happening April 14th, the first net zero school in the state of Florida. That's amazing. There's going to be an event April 14th talking about that, so you should be able to find the link in the chat function, or you can always contact me as well. My email is right there on the bottom. As a result of putting this together, we discovered there are many organizations in the state of Florida that are focused on climate change and sustainability, but we're not all pulling together and we don't even know about each other. So my research assistants and I are coming up with a database of all of those organizations for the state of Florida. So if you'd like to help with that, we welcome your participation. If you would like the list when we're done with it, we're happy to share it and we will be sharing it. And there are so many from statewide organizations like the Florida Climate Institute to more local organizations like Turn the Tide for Tarpon that I've been working with for several years to address sea level rise and issues of sustainability in the amazing little city of Tarpon Springs. So do email about that. We are also articulating tonight with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. 
And toward that end, here at USF, we just opened the USF SDG Action Alliance because we are focused on action and we want to do something about sustainability and climate change. So do get in touch on all those issues. And of course, we cannot have tonight's webinar without contextualizing in this time of coronavirus. It's a time for us to reflect on how human activity has affected the world. We're seeing pictures of clear skies over Los Angeles, and I'm sure you've seen this map of pollution over China. So as devastating as the virus is to our human family and our friends and our relatives, us pause to think about what our relationship is with the earth. So I just wanted to put that out there for us as well. To start the evening, we're going to show a six minute video created by the national organizers. And hopefully the video will work for you. There are a lot of technical difficulties with the internet right now and webinars. And if it doesn't, you'll find <laughs> the link in the chat function and you can always email me to get the link later as well. I'm going to pull our video over and hit play, and we're all going to cross our fingers that something happens and that you can actually see the video. And this is Dr. Eben Goldstein, who is one of the main national organizers. <laughs> Today, university he called me and he said that's what he was hoping. He didn't want to go in for surgery. But actually, he's in a good mood. He's okay enough to talk though. If I wanted to call him or something, you call him tonight. Call him now because I just talked to him like an hour ago. I would call him now. It might be before he gets sick again, before he goes to bed. Hi, Laura. I think your chat or your microphone is not muted. in almost all 50 U.S. states, Puerto Rico, D.C., and several other countries are hosting state and region-wide webinars focused on ambitious and feasible things that we can all do in our cities, our towns, and states in the coming year to really move the needle on climate change. Here is the most important idea to take home today. What you do locally will change the future. Fact, the U.S. state of Georgia is a top 10 solar state. The neighboring sunshine state of Florida has very little solar power due to outdated laws and regulations. When we launched Solve Climate a year ago, we could never have imagined that today, entire countries and much of the world's economy would be shut down with hundreds of thousands of people ill, thousands having passed away, and our health systems overwhelmed. I take that back. We could easily have imagined this. Our health experts and scientists warned us this was coming. After SARS and MERS, they told us this was coming, and yet we didn't take preventive action, we didn't prepare. COVID-19 has shown how fragile our health and economic systems are to extreme events. Our scientists have told us clearly that unchecked, climate change will turn our lives into an unending series of extreme events. Floods, droughts, rising sea levels, pests and disease, more extreme storms and hurricanes, all of this leaving hundreds of millions of people homeless and on the move. We can change this. We still have time to change that future. Last year, the world's top climate scientists told us that we have until 2030, 10 years now, to cut global warming pollution aggressively in order to stabilize the climate at the low end. That warning was the genesis for this national and international discussion today on how to solve climate by 2030. Solving climate in 10 years, that sounds challenging. And yet fixing the energy half of climate change by 2030 is looking more, not less likely than it was four years ago. The cost of solar and wind power, batteries, and electric vehicles have plummeted. In many cases, they are less expensive now than the fossil fuel power that causes global warming, and they are getting cheaper every day. Already, utility scale wind and solar, big solar and wind farms that feed power into the grid, these technologies are crushing fossil fuels in much of the US. In Colorado, Idaho, and California, 
Renewable bids are coming in at half the price that the cheapest fossil fuel plants can do. And this is where rooftop solar and battery systems are headed in the near future. On the vehicles front, all the major manufacturers see this coming. Mercedes-Benz announced last fall that they have designed their last gasoline-powered car. Going forward, every new model of theirs will be electric. Combining electric-powered vehicles with the impact of driverless technology, we could see a very rapid transition away from gasoline-based cars to EVs in the next decade. All this progress was the result of a major technology push by national governments. Starting in America in the 70s and then ramping up with the Danes, the British, the Japanese and Koreans, the Germans, and most recently the Chinese and Indians, government policies have brought these industries to scale. And now the market is taking over and renewables, battery storage and electric vehicles are on track to deliver power and transportation at prices unsubsidized that will lead to major disruptions of energy markets in the 2020s. Can we get there fast enough to solve climate? Well, this is where you come in. With plummeting prices for renewables and electric powered transports, the pace of the clean energy revolution will no longer be determined by Washington DC and other national governments. Instead, the core action is gonna be in your city, at your electric utility, and in your state capital. The key to solving climate by 2030 will be clearing the path at the local level to rapid deployment of solar, wind, battery storage, and electric vehicles. We need to get rid of outmoded laws and regulations that are holding back the transition. Florida needs to take the lesson from Georgia. It's imperative that we have justice in this transition. We have to make sure that the millions of green jobs that are created are jobs for all, and that everyone has access to clean, affordable power and mobility. Today, in Nebraska and New Jersey, in Idaho and Alabama, in Bangladesh and Brazil, we're gonna find out what are three ambitious but feasible things that we can do right at home to smooth the path for clean energy and to bring energy justice to our communities. Following the webinar, I hope you will join a group or class discussion about what you can do to make these solutions real. Then, what next? Well, this summer, young people in particular have a terrific opportunity to both support climate solutions and gain valuable job skills in a down economy. The most powerful thing you can do to solve climate by 2030 is to join the political campaign of a candidate who best represents your views on climate solutions. In doing that, you'll also learn how to communicate, you'll gain courage, and most importantly, be part of a creative, strong, powerful vision for the future. COVID-19 is giving us a stark lesson about what happens when we ignore warnings from science. Today, we'll see 10 years can be enough time to drive the climate solutions that we need, and the future will be what we make it. Thank you for the work you will do to solve climate. unmute myself. Uh, that was a word from our sponsor, Dr. Ethan Goldstein, sharing with us some of the ideas of what is happening with the national movement and the pleading to take action, which we hope to do. So now I would like to turn it over to Dr. Peter Stylang, who's the director of our Office of Sustainability here at USF, to share some of his thoughts change and also supporting the UN and their 75th anniversary. So I'll turn it over to you, Peter. Thanks very much, Brooke. That was a, uh, a great, powerful uh, video that we just watched. And um, I want to make some more interesting points, uh, particularly related to what uh, we can do on all of our participants tonight. And I see there's quite a few folks with us. Well, uh, I'm Peter Styling, the Assistant Vice, Vice Provost for Strategic Initiatives and Director of the Office of Sustainability. So, Brooke, if you could do the next slide, please. USF, the University of South Florida, has been a leader in terms of climate change. In 2018, we, uh, a group called UC3, the University Climate Change Coalition, came together a group of 20 powerful research universities, which were committed together to try and move forward local climate solutions because of a perceived inaction by the federal government. USF is the only member of this 
coalition in the state of Florida. And we were asked to join for a couple of reasons. One, because we've been active in the area of sustainability. We were a gold-rated institution. And two, because the town area is right in the crosshairs of climate change when you consider possible elevated sea levels or, or um, increased frequency of hurricanes. Brooke, if you could do the next slide, please. Thank you. So what it was this University Climate Change Coalition? Each of the universities pledged to conduct a, um, a forum where we got um, researchers, academics, business folks, um, government employees, state employees, city employees together to address climate change. Our forum was held on November the 1st last year, Science Strategies and, Strategies and Solutions Addressing Climate Change in Tampa Bay. So we have a, a broad array of experts at the university, but our focus was on four types of panel. Extreme events, such as uh, sea level rise, but also um, heavy rainfall events. Transportation, so critically here, the ability to move people um, in and around the Tampa Bay area, especially in light of uh, hurricanes and things of that nature. So should we, should we elevate roadways and so on? But of course, in elevating roadways, you might keep water behind the elevated roadways, exacerbating problems. So we discussed that. We also discussed the built environment. So how should we, how should we uh, build places for people to live and, and work and elevating our hospitals or our police stations and so on. And finally, public health and social justice. So in an increased warm, warm world, uh, would we be um, subject to increased diseases? For example, um, there's more opportunity for mosquitoes to breed and so on. In fact, in October last year, we reached a milestone where we had um, our first locally contracted case of dengue fever, which is transmitted by a mosquito. And if anyone's ever had that, and I have, it's not much fun. The good thing about these panels is that it wasn't just scientists talking to people. The panels consisted of, yeah, scientists or a content expert, but we wanted to try and get the local, uh, this information into the hands of a locally elected official, for example, a city mayor, and a government employee, like a city manager. So together, the latest knowledge would be transferred to people who could put things in operation, make changes, and make things happen. So it was a very effective forum um, from that point of view. Next slide, please, Brooke. So just a couple more points here um, that I want to make. We're, we're, um, we've been asked and, uh, to contribute to UN 75. This is a dialogue created by the United Nations on the occasion of their 75th birthday. So the UN really is looking for feedback on a variety of solutions. The UN has developed 17 sustainable development goals, as Brooke said earlier, and in the Patel College, they are experts on quite a few. Specifically tonight, we want to address the climate crisis, a race we can win. So what we want you to be thinking of is where do we want to be in the future in our climate and how do we get there? Very, very similar questions to those you heard a, a couple of minutes ago in the video. Uh, next slide, please, Brooke. So, the UN is particularly interested in getting a broad array of opinions from people on the street to students, to scientists and researchers, the business people and so on. So we really need your feedback on climate change, specifically five questions, only I think there are seven when I look at the list. The UN's interested in where do you think people will be in 2045? Will we be better off, worse off, or about the same as today? And of course, 2045 is the 100th anniversary of the UN. So that's why folks want your opinion now. They don't really want a, a, the opinions of people like me that will be old and doddery by then, but they really want the opinions of 
younger people, diverse folks who will be living in that time. What do you want to see when the year that the UN turns 100? And, and what are the main obstacles and challenges that will prevent us getting to your vision? How can the UN better cooperate with its partners? How can it manage these challenges? What can the UN do differently than the way it does business right now? How can it speed up change? What would you do? What would you advise the UN to do to address this challenge? And I put in there, be specific. Now, um, let's have the last slide, if we can, please, Brooke. So we went to collect your feedback and send it to the United Nations. Only it's going to be your feedback. So we're going to attribute it to you personally. And if people put a, 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 a great solution, or they ask great questions, or they have good ideas, um, we will submit these to the United Nations because they're gathering in uh, this feedback. And the best ideas from around the country will be put to the member states and senior officials during the during UN Global Assembly in New York in September. So that's a pretty good opportunity for your voice to be heard, not only on a national stage, but on a global stage too. So it's a great opportunity for you and we really, really want your feedback. USF will keep pushing hard as part of the climate solution, but your voice has a chance to travel all around the world if you take the trouble. So with that, I'm gonna pass things back to Brooke and the team. I really appreciate the opportunity for talking to you this evening. And I look forward to rest to the rest of the proceedings. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. It's very important, as you said, to encourage every voice to be heard. And we will make sure those voices come together and make it to the UN. I wanted to mention today is World Health Day sponsored by the World Health Organization. So, so many movements coming together. As we know, all of this is interrelated. So we're gonna move on in our agenda for this evening and turn things over to Yoko Arditi Rocha, who is from the Clio Institute. And the Clio Institute has an amazing array of resources for our state, from videos to speaker banks, and so much more. Thank you so much, Yoko, for being with us tonight. And just let me know when you want me to change the next slide. I'm gonna probably let you introduce yourself a little bit and then I'll go to your slide number two. Thank you, Brooke. Um, thank you so much for putting this wonderful event together. Um, I am the executive director of the Clio Institute. Um, for those of you who do not know the Clio Institute, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization um, in the state of Florida that focuses on building climate literacy, advocacy, and engagement. And we've been around for about a decade in the state of Florida uh, driving climate action. Uh, we have offices in Miami and in Orlando and in Tallahassee, so South, um, Central, and North Florida. Please make sure you check our website to learn more about our programs. Um, and I'll, I'll be happy to, to talk about those as we go along on the, on the presentation. Um, you know, as, as Brooke contextualized our, our, our um, gathering here today, um, the world has seen an unprecedented response to the COVID-19 crisis. Guided by science, we are seeing elected officials mobilize, putting people in front, um, you know, putting uh, people in front of profits, having thousands of events canceled, restaurants closed, offices vacated, hundreds of cruise ships anchor all around the world. We're seeing that urgent response um, and, and we, all of us know here that urgent response is needed both on the climate and the COVID-19 crisis. Um, COVID-19 also has proven us that reducing coal plant energy demands and shutting down factories and grounding airplanes, to name a few, uh, bring pollution levels down. And we're seeing, you know, blue skies in many places around the world, um, like in China and uh, also in Italy, um, as we saw in some of those diagrams. You know, we hope that uh, this crisis really can catalyze a collective effort. And they can really bring- We don't that it was a major loss. Run accident reports, look for young victims. She seems to be- 
character heroes. Okay, so, you guys, I'm I doing think... that now, but this will take forever. Tampa's uh, got keeping almost issues half again, of Yoga. We have a story. I'm like, even some of the Yeah. Is that? Oh, yeah. Get rid of that. Super skills just squelch my pessimism. I have a couple of accidents here. I think I got it. Okay, Yoka, continue on. Uh, technology. Uh, we all have to adapt to this new reality, right? Um, so anyway, we're just saying that if, you know, there's one thing we can hope out of this crisis is really that we can catalyze that collective effort, one that really brings, um, you know, that strengthens our collective humanity, preparing us, preparing us for what we know is a bigger crisis um, and needs a bigger response. Climate change is, it's, The slide you don't need to be a climate scientist to see how our climate is changing uh, but through education innovation and adherence to our climate commitments we can make the necessary changes to protect our, our planet there are huge opportunities a lot of solutions which we're going to talk about now um, and i hope that today you leave inspiring to know that there are many things that we can do today so as you can see from the slide on the screen um, we have put together um, uh, just a, a ten, the 10 most substantial solutions to address climate change from the drought Dome project. And I know one of my fellow presenters will talk in more detail about that. Um, but I want to talk to you about a few of those solutions that you can start taking today uh, without any cost involved. Um, the drought Dome project has compiled about 100 solutions. Most substantial solutions, although there are 100 more uh, or 90 more. We're going to talk about a few ones. Um, if you can pass on the slides, Brooke, that'd be great. Uh, that, like I said, you can start um, implementing in your own lifestyles. And the first one that um, we're going to talk about out of those 10 solutions that I want to talk about today is uh, reducing food waste. Um, if, food, if food waste would be a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter after the US and China. So think about that, um, you know, the impact that, you, you know, the whole world can have by reducing uh, food waste. In the US alone, we throw away, away about 40% of the food that we produce. Um, so not only do we have a huge uh, food, inse food insecurity in our country and around the world, we can be solving another uh, sustainable development goal, goal from the United Nations, which is ending hunger, which we could, we could always also be addressing the climate crisis. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to just kind of uh, put it in perspective. Um, as you can see, the, uh, the second, the second uh, solution that we're, next slide, thanks. Uh, the next uh, solution that we're advocating for is to try to adopt a, a more plant-rich diet. We're not telling you to go vegan. We're not telling you to go uh, vegetarian. We're certainly telling you to increase your uh, uh, foods based, um, plant-based foods in your diet. 62% uh, of the emissions that come uh, from agriculture are generated by our meat consumption. And 24% of our Americans eat the equivalent of three hamburgers per day. Uh, so imagine that the amount of um, heat trapping gases we could be reducing by just um, uh, you know, adopting more plant-based foods. Um, and think about you know, the health benefits that that can just bring to all of us and um, as, well, as well as to our waste. So I think that's a solution that everybody can uh, rally behind. Next slide, please. Next slide. The third, the third solution that I like to advocate um, is to, uh, in order to reduce food, food waste, you can also compost at home. So one way that you can bring, um, you know, more, a more uh, organic, rich fertilizers to your gardens and to, um, you know, to 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 reduce food waste is to composting your food scraps, food scraps and your yard waste currently um, inside your home. Um, I compost at home. Uh, it's one of the most therapeutic things that I love to do. But the main reason why we want you to start implementing composting at home is because when uh, food waste goes into our landfill, um, it goes into the an anaerobic phase, releasing methane. And I'm sure most of you know that methane is a very potent greenhouse um, gas and that can hold about 20 times the more heat than CO2. 
So reducing our food waste and composting at home are really great climate solutions that everybody can start implementing now without um, much cost added. Next slide, please. Next slide. The fourth solution that uh, I'd like to advocate, of course, we want to advocate and always try to choose mass transportation um, or biking or walking whenever we, you know, uh, possible. But more than 70% of Americans do drive um, every day to do their daily activities. Uh, we're seeing electric vehicle sales on the rise, um, and we want to make sure that we can electrify our, our, our transportation. Uh, so when possible, go electric. There are great incentives um, to go electric. And the, the, when you really come to put in the amount of gas you save, um, it is a, a great economical uh, opportunity. I have myself a, a, an electric car and a hybrid car. So it, consider choosing to a, a more um, efficient uh, way of transportation when possible. Next slide. The fifth, fifth, fifth solution that we want to advocate living especially in the Sunshine State, and as we heard from um, one of our organizers, um, is to go solar. Unfortunately, here in the Sunshine State, only 1% of our energy comes from um, renewables, uh, which is something that must change. Um, so there are great opportunities out there. The prices have gone significantly. We, are getting, we can get a 26% deduction from federal taxes. Last year used to be 30, and a couple of years before um, used to be higher. Uh, but it still is a good deduction that everybody can um, get uh, if you go solar. And if you're interested in going through a co-op, you can find one near you. And I have listed down the Solar United Neighbors website where you can find a co-op near you, which is uh, trying to buy solar as a bulk to reduce the price of, of going solar. Next, next. Number six solutions that I wanted to um, advocate is to try to fly less. With the COVID-19 crisis, we have seen um, how we are able to, you know, to, not to go live as usual, but really find innovative ways to communicate, go about business, and, and socializing. Um, I have put on the screen uh, uh, an image that came out today from The Guardian comparing traffic, air traffic from 2019 and 2020. Um, of course, inevitably, we need to mobilize, and when there is no other option, if you have to fly, then you should ups offset. And you can offset your carbon emissions, um, not only from your flying, but from uh, your entire carbon footprints with platforms like TerraPass.com, which I have listed also on the website. Um, next slide. I kind of go hand in hand uh, with you know, your superpowers. All of us have superpowers that we can enact uh, in trying to, um, you know, uh, uh, trying to solve the climate crisis. The first one we've been talking about um, when we talk about the power of our purchases or the power of your purse. All the choices that we make have an impact on our planet. We have to choose um, sustainable and environmental friendly options to try to reduce our impact in the world. So think about buying organic and buying local when, when possible. Think about how you can go solar um, in your, you know, uh, immediate or me immediate or uh, medium term future. And think about next time you're going to change your car, if you can uh, afford or go electric. The eighth solution is you, the power of your voice. Um, and that is a very powerful superpower that we all have. You know, you are all uh, here because you have a clear interest in solving the climate crisis. And you can put that energy into really um, and to really amplify your voice. You need to be able that your voice is heard. And there are many ways you can do that. Obviously, using um, social media to do to do so, it's a great way. Um, but also writing a letter to your editor of your local newspaper or a national newspaper, writing letters to members of Congress or your local mayor or municipalities. The power of your voice is incredible. And trust me, when the people speak. Politicians listen, so don't underestimate the power of your voice. Uh, number nine is the power of your vote, and we heard that from the organizers. Um, you know, it is more important to change environmental friendly laws, to, you know, look for and pursue climate um, action policies and, and, and changing and protecting laws that protect our environment. Um, and so that is definitely more important than changing light bulbs these days or recycling. Not that I'm not advocating for recycling and changing light bulbs, but saying that the power of your vote um, can go a long, long way. We need to, um, you know, use the 
you know, we, we need to use the, the power of, of making our voices heard, not only through our prayers, but also through our vote. And I know that one of my fellow um, uh, presenters are going to talk to you on how you can register to vote and how to really, um, you know, promote civic engagement within your community and you can be part of that. Next slide. Um, and the last and not least is um, I wanted to tell you that, you know, don't be a bystander. We all play a role uh, in trying to solve this huge crisis and really change starts with you. Um, all of us can become climate speakers and this, the Clio Institute offers a, a, a certification um, training that you can learn to properly um, talk about the science, the impacts and the solution. We have an online training that starts now on April 21st, so you can look at the, into that in our website. But also talk about this with your friends and family. Talk about what you learned today. It's important that we talk what's going on. Um, and, and last but not least, I wanted to um, also ask you to sign our, the Florida Climate Pledge today. Go to floridaclimatepledge.org and sign and pledge for solutions that can really um, turn Florida into a climate conscious state. Um, in the picture here, you see a, a, a young lady um, uh, in high school who went to speak in front of the City of Miami Commission asking for the mayor to declare a climate emergency. Um, and a few hours later, the mayor of Miami declared a climate emergency and about six other municipalities have followed suit. So don't underestimate the power of your voice. Again, don't underestimate the power of your vote and don't underestimate the power that you have to change the world. And by, um, next slide, please. Um, you know, I'm sure you have heard um, a favorite quote from Margaret Mead, never underestimate what a, a small group of committed citizens can do to change the world. Um, indeed, it's the only thing that it has ever, you know, has. Um, it is it's such a, a, a powerful quote. It really talks about the power of the people. And I think, you know, is the attitude that we're going to be, um, that the attitude that, that we put forward to solve this crisis that is going to uh, determine our success. So I wanted to end with this quote because it really res resonates of what we're trying here today, which is to try to solve climate by 2030. Again, it's not our attitude. I mean, it is our attitude, not our aptitude that will de determine our altitude or our success. So I thank you so much for the opportunity and I look forward to answering those questions later on um, at the end of the webinar. Thanks so much for the opportunity. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Yoka. That was very inspirational. I'm excited about the opportunities that the Clio Institute has, not just for our students here at USF, but for students all over the state and even the country take your trainings and to take advantage of what you have. You have such an excellent website and I'm so glad that we found each other. Thank you. I think I'm so happy too. If you put on the next slide, Brooke, I think um, there is some um, resources there that you can share um, with the audience too. You can obviously follow us on social media. We're on Twitter and Facebook and on Instagram. Um, and like I said, our website, which is um, cleoinstitute.org. And I, I look forward to connecting with all of you later on. Again, thank you so much for the opportunity. I look forward to your questions. Yes, and we look forward to many collaborations in the future. So now we'll move on in our program to our next speaker. And actually, before we move on to the next speaker, I just wanted to promote one of the webinars that the Clio Institute is helping to put on simulating global climate solutions. What is it really going to take? And that's happening tomorrow from 1 to 2.30. So if you look at your chat right now, you'll see the link to that Eventbrite and you can take advantage of that. So I wanted to jump right in and promote the events that you're putting on, Yoka. So thank you so much for that. And now we'll be moving on in our program. Thank you so our, much. Yeah, that's right. To our next speaker, Laura Stargell, who is near and dear to our hearts because she is a Patel College of Global Sustainability student but she's much more than that. She's the Florida field organizer for our climate. So Laura, I will turn it over to you so we can hear your words of inspiration for solving climate by 2030. Thank you so much, Brooke. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you okay. great. With this technology, I just wanna make sure before I talk to myself for 10 minutes. Um, so like Brooke said, I am Laura Sargill and I'm the Florida field organizer for our climate and I'm also a Cattell College Global Science Sustainability Master's student. I want to tell you a little bit about my climate story, how I got involved, and then what I think are the best solutions to solve climate by 2030. 
So like I said, my name is Laura and I'm a seventh generation Floridian. So I grew up in Central Florida and many of my ancestors are also from Central Florida. But a few years ago, I moved to Germany. And so I lived in Europe during the record breaking deadly heat waves the past few years. Um, and hundreds of people were dying because the government didn't adapt enough to climate change. And it was really terrifying and really eye opening. Um, so I'd already made a bunch of climate conscious shifts in my personal life, like lowering my footprint. Um, I went vegan a few years ago, but I realized that it wasn't enough to just do climate on the side and that this was something that I really needed to dedicate everything to. So when I moved back to Florida um, and I noticed that next to nothing was being done politically about it, I mean, which is not surprising because the words climate change were basically banned from the executive government for the past eight years. Um, but I decided to take all of my life skills and education and devote it to climate action. Um, as a member of Generation Z, I felt that I was too young and too ill-equipped to make this change. But in actuality, I realized that I was in a position to relate to, to empower, and to mobilize the generations that are going to be most affected by climate change. Um, so that's whenever I became the Florida Field Organizer for Our Climate, which is a youth-led nonprofit that mobilizes and educates young people to act on science-based and equitable climate policies. To the South climate by 2030, in my opinion, the best way to solve climate by 2030 is we're going to need local political action. So I don't think it's going to be something that's going to happen in DC, but it's going to be something that happens in Lake City and in Daytona and in Fort Lauderdale and in Apopka and in Winter Haven and all over the corners of the state. All of us having collective action is going to be much larger than what can happen, just like how Evan said before. Um, so on that note too, cities and counties are the backbone of the low carbon economy. So the decisions that they make on transportation and waste management and how they do utility management, our accessibility to electric vehicle infrastructure, those are all things that happen at the city and county level. Um, I also think we need to advocate for a price, a national price on greenhouse gas emissions. And I think we need multi-level climate governance. But I think you can be the biggest change maker at the local level. And so that's what I wanna talk about, the ways that we can get engaged in political involvement on the local level. So the first thing, and I love, I love yoga and I love the Cleo Institute and I love how we have so many overlapping themes um, because I think that just shows that how much the power of your voice and your vote have. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is your voice. It isn't your job to be a policy expert. Nobody's asking you to be a policy expert, but it is your job to tell your story. You're the only person who can tell your story. So write the letters to the editors, write the opinion editorials. I mean, it's less than 750 words. And if you don't get that voice out there, then it's not assured that somebody else will. So we need to start taking more responsibility and using our voice. Um, another thing is sharing it with your local lawmakers. So it's called be a thorn in their side about climate action. So I actually met with um, a local congressman this past week with one of the fellows. And we were talking about other climate policies, but it came up in conversation. We asked him like, how much um, it was hit with his office, but we asked them how much like they are hearing about these climate, you know, constituents concerned about climate. And he said, like, really, not really, not much. And he wanted us to be a resource. And there's so many resources in the state. Um, but I think it's important that that's never the answer, that even if they're not acting, they're hearing from us all the time. It's really great for us to do grassroots organization. And we're going to talk about how we can elect other people in the office. But the people that we do have in office need to know that this is a priority for us. Um, so the second thing I want to talk about is to vote. So we have many people in office that are probably climate policy allies, but we need to elect more climate policy champions. We need people that are going to be the front runners on this climate policy in office. And voting can be really discouraging and it can feel like, you know, your vote is just a drop in the bucket. It's not doing anything. But those in Palm Beach, Palm Beach County area probably know its value because from the 2018 election, um, House District 89 was decided by a margin of 32 votes. So out of 80,000 voters in for the election, 32 votes was the decision. So thinking about a city the size of like Fort Myers, just us on this call would have been like a landslide margin compared to what, what that was decided by. So I think that it's really important for us to recognize like that can be the difference between a climate champion and a climate denier being in office. So sometimes voting can seem really overwhelming, especially on the national level. But just remember, when you get into the smaller like offices, it's a really important thing that you make sure you get out and vote for the climate champions. Um, I also want to touch on that if you live in a conservative area, you may feel like this doesn't apply to you and that it doesn't make sense to get out and vote. 
but I also just want to say that's not the case. Um, Republican Representative Vance Lupus was the House sponsor for one of the very few climate bills we had at the statewide level this year. And actually, the Senate sponsor was Senator Rodriguez, who's pictured there in the little vote in his little boots. He has boots that say Act on Climate Florida. He's been wearing them every day in session for the past three years. So it's not just there's so much bipartisan action. Um, if you look at Students for Carbon Dividends, which is a it's a bipartisan but conservative leaning organization, FAU College Republicans, UF College Republicans, University of Miami College Republicans are all a part of the founding coalition. So recognizing that young conservatives do care about climate action. And so if um, like if we are electing conservatives in the office, we need to make sure that they're climate champion conservatives too. So it's not just something for Blue District. Um, also, just a little plug on that note, if you are interested, our climate is having some of our young leaders from across the whole country are doing a conservative slash rural engagement webinar on Thursday. And um, so I will drop that link in the chat after this. But if people are interested in more conversation about how to engage conservatives on climate action, I think it's super important. The last thing that I want to talk about is volunteering. We need you to to leave you with one last inspiring story about the Tallahassee 100% Together Coalition that our climate and the Clio Institute is a part of also. Um, so Tallahassee 100% Together started in 2017. It's an organization of grassroots citizens, members of the community, businesses that came together and decided they wanted to urge the city of Tallahassee to have 100% renewable goals. Um, I don't know what the initial year was whenever they decided to come together, but I think it was 2035. And what they were able to do was last year, because of the actions by Tally 100% together, they had the city of Tallahassee pass a resolution that said by 2050, all of the city of Tallahassee will private and public will be on renewable energy. And by 2035, this the public city utility, so all of their infrastructure will be on renewable energy. And Tally 100 is not giving up there, where they keep pushing it forward. They were able to get a um, the solar farms, the wait list to get solar energy in Tallahassee is crazily long. So I think it's really important to recognize that grassroots organization that happens in all of our small towns across the state. If you have any questions about Tally 100 Together, grassroots organizing, um, I would love to help get you connected on how we can do that. Another thing that I said is it's important to get climate emergency declarations, try and get more and more of our cities to recognize, to come together, that this is something just like COVID-19, we need urgent action on climate. Um, so these grassroots organizing, all of our, basically all of our policies of society started with grassroots organizing. So utilizing whatever skills you have to organize your community, I think is super important. Um, I will leave the links for you to get involved with our climate, with any of the events I mentioned, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Laura. You are such an inspiration. We are so lucky to have you here in the state of Florida, and thank you so much for that. We're going to move on in our program. Last but not least, Dr. T.H. Colhane, who is a vortex of energy and more inspiration for addressing climate change, and he is the director of our climate change program here at the Patel College of Global Sustainability. TH, I will turn it over to you and just let me know when you want me to advance the slides. Hopefully we have not lost TH to the, the vortex of technology. Uh, no, just a, a technical problem with a mouse. Can you hear me now? Oh, excellent. Can hear you now. So TH, okay. take it away and let me know when you want me to go forward. Great. Let's, uh, well, before, before we change the slide, I just want to call attention to the man who's standing to my right in the image, actually my left in real life, but the right in the image. That's Dr. Seneshot Sige, who was my predecessor as the director of the Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation Program at USS Patel College. And now he's at Florida Gulf Coast University. And you see us there uh, a few months ago building a food energy water nexus and zero waste research site for our students at Patel and his students at FGCU uh, to show climate drawdown solutions that anybody can build anywhere. And he's originally from Ethiopia, and my family goes back to Iraq and Lebanon. My wife is from Palestine. We share a lot of interest in making sure that any solutions that we work on 
have applicability to people in developing regions, to the disadvantaged, to people of low income, to people of limited means, and to all of us when there is a crisis where our economy and our uh, access to resources becomes limited. Uh, so um, the ideas that I want to share with you are really on the grassroots, very local level that have been field tested in slums and uh, in uh, underdeveloped regions uh, around the globe. So if we go to the next slide, uh, I want to uh, dovetail and thank Yoka for highlighting the drawdown solutions because at ECGS, and I see your drawdown book behind you, Brooke, on the, on the desk there, this has become the Bible or main text of our program. And we spend very little time talking about the, uh, the issues surrounding the politics of climate change. The science of climate change, as far as we're concerned, is so well established and has been going back to Savante Arrhenius in the 1800s that uh, we don't really feel that we have to expend a lot of energy and, and, uh, uh, and time looking at where the trends are going, uh, because even the best case scenario we know is dire. So we work on the drawdown solutions that we can get a real grasp on as individuals, as families, as communities, as students and faculty. And the food waste issue that you brought up, Yoka, looms largest for us because refrigerant management, while I am working on that and I have a uh, partially biogas powered refrigerator that otherwise is on propane and solar electricity. Uh, refrigeration management is tough for most people to work on. And the, uh, the second, uh, the issue of wind power, we do have a small windmill here at the Rosebud Continuum Sustainability Education Center that our students have helped us to install. Uh, it doesn't produce a lot of power, but it does when there's hurricane force winds. Otherwise, Land of Lakes is not windy. It would have been better for the coast. But so the top tier solutions of refrigeration management and, um, and wind are not things that we can all get behind. But one thing that we can absolutely all get behind, and it is the focus of so much of my research, is what you see in this diagram, the transformation of this obscene amount of wasted photosynthetic energy and nutrients uh, going to landfill. And then, as Yoka said, turning into a methane that is contributing to the greenhouse gas emissions in a considerable way. Instead, we look at the fact that the fact that food waste produces methane can be a good thing, and it can offset our use of fossil sources of methane that are really driving a lot of climate change. When oil is being drilled, when natural gas is being drilled, the methane releases uh, that amount of methane that is not captured are catastrophic. You can fly over as I have Kuwait and Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, and look down and from the airplane, you can see the amount of methane being flared off that which they can convert to carbon dioxide as it's, uh, as it's flaring off the oil fields. And then you know that a substantially larger portion is just being released without being converted to carbon dioxide through flaring, unused, um, unburned, useless to society. So, we look at drawdown solution number 64 and drawdown solution 30, which are large and small biodigesters uh, respectively in the drawdown uh, pantheon. And drawdown solution number three is all of a piece that we can all do at home. Because if I queried each of you and said, hey, got food waste? I mean, got milk, got spoiled milk, got food waste? We all do. And we can't cry over the spilled milk. We've got to say, we're all gonna have food the parts that we don't eat, no matter how religiously we observe eating every last bit and using leftovers. There are plant parts and animal parts that we're not gonna ingest and there are parts of that meal that are gonna go bad. That is, they're gonna be food for microbes, but not food for people in any healthy sense. And so we take this super seriously that the number one solution for us as a people should be the complete elimination of food waste as a concept and a reality. And composting is lovely, and I don't want to knock composting because I still compost. But what I discovered over 11, well, actually it was 2003, so that would be 17 years ago, but then started putting into practice 11 years ago in 2009, traveling in India and China and Kenya 
and uh, in Egypt was that people have known for thousands of years that you can not only turn food waste into a valuable source of fertilizer, but you can turn it into fuel as well. Even Marco Polo came back from China in the 13th century talking about how they were transforming their organic wastes into biogas. And Europe was using it at times in the 1800s, and we know because Marx and Engels wrote about it as a way of controlling the metabolic rift. So this is a kind of no-brainer where we go back to the future and say food waste can be turned into fuel and fertilizer. And if we go to the next slide, um, you see uh, a National Geographic expedition I made in 2010 after doing biogas work in the Middle East and Africa. That's me lying on my side in the picture underneath the flame. And we're on Lake Eak, where organic residuals from thousands of years ago in the permafrost had been locked in and the microbial decomposition had been very slow because permafrost was assumed to be permanent. And then the permafrost started melting because of climate change. And the microbes that had been in somnolescence, that had been hibernating in those permafrost sediments began to wake up. And these are psychrophilic microbes that digest stuff as low as four degrees Celsius and uh, will start becoming metabolically active at zero degrees at the, at the phase change point. And they're decomposing all this organic matter and they're releasing prodigious amounts of methane uh, as the permafrost melts. And we were there flaring it, but you can't go all over the lakes and flare all of it off. So our project with National Geographic was to harness these microbes and put these genies in a bottle and show people that the natural archaea, the microbes that turn food waste and other organic material, including toilet waste, into methane and into liquid nutrient soups for other parts of the ecology to work on could be symbiotically harnessed to work with us. And so we started working with National Geographic support on getting these microbes from all over the world. And it turns out the best sources from your baby's diaper waste, as I did, and one of those dads who changed the diaper because I wanted what was in it. And uh, your own gut and that of your dog and your cat and that of your community and your cow and your horse and your sheep and your local lake mud. And then use those microbes in a tank to turn all your food waste into both fuel and fertilizer. So you're not just getting the compost element out of it. You are getting that and it's nutrient retaining. It holds on to the nitrogen much better than aerobic composting. But in these simple barrels, you see a five gallon water jug that we've been teaching uh, in Ireland and at MIT and in, uh, in Kenya. And then on the left bottom, you see a diagram that one of our students, Sarah Marie Long, who I think is with us, has joined us, uh, made of the, uh, the 200 liter oil drum biodigester that she made in her apartment here which we've been teaching people for, for, um, for decades to make. Uh, and then you see a pickle barrel biodigester in Palestine uh, that we designed. And then, oh, there's Sarah's on the right. There's Sarah's uh, wonderful uh, home biodigester labeled with these great icons that she showed at the Florida State Fair. It turns out that any tank, whether it's made of plastic or leather or metal or concrete or brick or, or mud, if it can hold water, it can be a biodigester. And you put the microbes in and you wait for three weeks, as our students have done, and it starts to fart out gas because it's just a stomach. We like to call it the domestic dragon. And then it produces liquid fertilizer and each tank can handle 1 40th its volume. That means that the 200 liter barrel that our student Sarah has can handle about two or three cups of food waste a day. Whereas, the next slide please, our, our Solar Cities uh, IBC tank biodigester that we developed in Egypt back in 2009, living in the Zabalin garbage collector, collector's community. Uh, these can handle a bucket, that is a five gallon paint bucket filled with ground up food waste per day and produce what you see floating in that left uh, stack of biodigesters, uh, which is a hundred, uh, sorry, thousand liters of biogas or methane, which can be used for cooking for about two hours on the flames that you see under our pots down at the bottom right. So we've been championing this solution that anybody can build a biodigester system for a few hundred dollars out of local parts that you can get anywhere. We found them in the slums of Cairo. We found them in the slums of the Dominican Republic. We found them in Haiti. We found them 
every community we've been to from the Arctic Circle down to South Africa, we have found these tanks either at low cost or discarded and turned them into effective solutions that go way beyond mere composting because you get the methane that you capture and use to offset fossil fuels and you can grow new healthy food and turn sand into soil as we're doing here in Florida. And that other picture down in the lower left is my former uh, student from South Central Los Angeles, who was a gang member and a, um, and a drug dealer when I met him and now is a renewable energy uh, specialist. But back in the day, he got at first interested in a biogas solution so he could grow marijuana on the free hydroponic nutrients and then be able to do backyard barbecues with his friends. Um, he's now changed his ways, but he's, uh, he, he laughs and talks about how there's many incentives to the, these drawdown solutions. You don't have to be thinking, I'm going to save the world because the values are so high. Next slide, please. The values are so high that our great friends in Israeli companies home biogas, when I embarked on the teach everybody how to build it themselves, they launched a company, a startup called Home Biogas. You see us in Pennsylvania with our Solar Cities nonprofit organization and members of the Mennonite and the, um, and the Amish community who have vested interests in staying off grid. And biogas is one of the technologies that many of them have embraced. And we're there teaching how to build out of IBC tanks, but also how to buy a very inexpensive six to $700 commercial home biogas system that sets up in an hour. Brooke uh, and the students showed it at the Florida State Fair this year. We showed it last year at the Florida State Fair. The new version, the 2.0, is the one down in the bottom right, which just inflates in a few minutes. It comes out of the box and you have a home biodigester ready to use. Uh, if you go to a neighbor who has, the inoculant, it's ready to use the next morning. Otherwise, you fill it with manure and wait for three weeks, and then it's ready to use every day. Uh, so there's definite incentives to this at every scale. So when I say every scale, if you go to the next slide, uh, we also have here at USF, up at the Rosebud Continuum, the Chinese steel molds that are used to build community and commercial digesters of a larger size. The top picture shows the one that our students at Patel College built with the Kersey family of Noble Crust restaurants at Fat Beat Farm. And then to keep it running year round, we installed a 50 vacuum tube solar hot water system uh, that keeps it at body temperature because it's just a giant dragon. And if you look down at the lower right, you see the one here we have at Rosebud where I live off grid and it actually has a dragon's head. And you see me one night with a student, uh, a middle school kid who came up to watch the dragon breathe fire at night and I'm lighting the nostrils but we normally don't flare it because we use it for our cooking and to heat our shower water. And one of the nice things about living at the Rosebud Continuum is that my wife and I are able to live off grid. And that means that between the solar panels, rarely the windmill, which doesn't do much, unfortunately, the three large biodigesters, one is the dragon you see on the right, the other one in the middle is shaped to look like Snow White's wishing well. It has solar panels and batteries under here and a biogas bag under the roof. But it's another big biodigester, half buried. And then on the left, you see a little dome. That's the completely buried biodigester. So we can handle restaurant waste. We can handle three barrels of restaurant waste every day, which until COVID-19 stopped a lot of the work we were getting delivered here from restaurants. So we can make a substantial impact. And then we grow so much of our food from the liquid fertilizer in the greenhouse back there. We never buy fertilizer ever. So we've ended our use of fossil fuel fertilizers and the ripple effects just continue on and on like that. So in conclusion, what I'd like to say is if we look at the food waste issue and the biodigesters, Drawdown Solutions 3, 30, and 64, as the solar plexus of the food energy water nexus, and if we look at that as the most efficient and easy way to obtain solar energy, because everybody, all of you, all of us have food waste and toilet waste and organic waste, yard waste that can all be put into a biodigester. Then we have a nexus solution that acts as the centerpiece around which our photovoltaics and our wind and our refrigerant management and our conservation measures, efficiency measures can all pool around. But I'll say one thing in conclusion, it's the same thing I said when the US government uh, sent me to Poland on Earth Week two years ago,
to talk about how to deal with the conflict between the coal lobby and the renewable energy people there. And they put me on stage in many universities and think tanks, and they said, we have brought Dr. Culhane from PCGS because he life tests these solutions, and he's unmovable about this. When, um, when Laura, you talked about us acting as bridges, and you talked about telling your story, the story I tell is one of utter confidence that I hope will blow away our politicians' uh, false confidence when they speak with such bluster. I can say with utter confidence that you can never get me to part from my food waste or my toilet waste, and now all the plastic that I'm keeping because I clean it all so I can get the food residuals out of the yogurt cup. You ain't getting my, well, let me say it like this as if I was uh, cocking a shotgun in a true libertarian sort of conservative Florida fashion. Ch -ch -ch. You don't get my shit. That's my shit. I bought it at Walmart. I paid for it. I brought it home. I used it. It's mine. I ain't giving it to you or the city or the government or nobody. That's my shit. And that confidence makes me feel like it's like Malcolm X said, you don't criticize a person for drinking a dirty glass of water. You simply hold a clean glass of water up and say, which would you like? And when you're so confident telling your story that you are not going to ever go on grid again because you've got food waste and you hope everybody else will use theirs or give it to you, that becomes a political message. That becomes a moment when the politicians are hearing these people aren't going to stop. There's nothing we can do. It's like making moonshine, except it's benefiting everybody. So that's my, my basic take. Start with solutions 330 and 64 and watch it ripple out to being a powerful, powerful movement. Thank you. Thank you, TH. An amazing educational living learning laboratory you have created at Rosebud. We are so appreciative of everything that you have done there. And what a great message. So we're going to move on to some of the questions that have come out of our presenters talking about different solutions for climate change. We will re-engage them now with some of these. <coughs> and the first one is, how do we combat the politics of misinformation about climate and climate change that is so common? Like to take that one on. Could you restate the question? It was a little hard to hear you. Okay, sure. So the first question is how do we combat the politics of misinformation about climate and climate change that is so common? Laura, do you want to take that one? I would love to take that one. Um, so I think that that's really hard, especially looking at a political level, looking at, I mean, the Republican Party as a whole for a long time has just been saying that climate change is not human. Um, and one thing on just a positive note is that I actually met with Senator Scott and Ross Spano's office, who are both local congressmen this past week. And um, both of them are no longer climate deniers. So I think in a very positive direction, both of them re recognize climate change. Um, so I think what we've been doing so far has been really effective. And um, their statistics, I know from, I can post this, the link in the chat from the statistics, but like there was one done in Florida earlier this year that 76% of people, um, especially it was a Republican poll, Republicans agreed that climate change was human, was human cause. So I don't think that there's too much for us to do other than what we're already doing and keeping electing people that are not climate deniers, holding our elective officials accountable, making them vote on whether climate change is human caused. Um, that would be my input. Okay, thank you, Laura. Next question from one of our chat participants. I think this one is for UTH. How do we help underprivileged adapt solutions into their lifestyles? Because you've seen that around the world. So how do we do that? How do we empower the underprivileged to, to bring these solutions into their life? So that's a great question. But the, the answer is a bit uncomfortable, which is that the underprivileged have been the generators of these solutions. And they implement them whenever they're not stopped actively by the privileged. 
I learned about biodigesters in the slums of Pune, India, and saw people who made me cry because unlike other homes and places where there was more, uh, more top-down management, the people who had escaped that kind of scrutiny were using their biodigesters and didn't have blackened lungs and, and, and ceilings and walls charred with, with soot from the, the, the wood fires and charcoal fires and kerosene fires that kill four to seven million women and children every year in areas where people are not given freedom of access to information and materials. And they built them out of basically garbage cans uh, that they had and thrown away things. The biodigester I designed that I show you was designed in the slums of Cairo with the trash recycling population, the underclass, the sort of untouchables of Cairo, who didn't know about biodigester technology. But when I brought it to them as a graduate student, said, well, then why can't we make it out of these discarded tanks that are sitting around in the garbage? And I didn't have an answer because I'd gone to conferences and thought it was a high-tech German solution that needed, you know, the Frankenstein kind of uh, apparatus to do. Uh, wherever I went, and fortunately National Geographic sent me all over the world to look at exactly this problem, it was in the most impoverished places where people were doing the most creative work. Uh, African innovation in Kenya and Tanzania blew my mind, and I thought, I'm just going to bring solutions to the so-called privileged who are actually intellectually underprivileged in my mind because they've never suffered the deprivation to think uh, that they're going to have to live without being able to get everything at the pressing of a button or a drive to the local supermarket. So I don't want to be too radical in this, but I think that if we work on our own solutions and focus on taking care of our backyard, really it starts at home and then it ripples out because as E.F. Schumacher pointed out, when appropriate technology was introduced and he was one of the champions of it, it failed because Westerners and Northerners were bringing solutions going, this would be good for you people. You're so underprivileged, you're so impoverished, you'll accept this. They go, what do you use uh, in the West? And they would say, well, oh, I use uh, electric heater and I use a uh, drive of this. And so they said, well, shoot, if you don't use it, why should we? So when we in the so-called privileged areas are relying on these technologies and you ain't gonna make me give mine up, you can make it sexier as the Israeli company, our good friends have done, but even, uh, even then, I like doing it myself and knowing I can build it myself. That, that kind of American, pull yourself by your bootstraps, can doism is infectious. And people say, well, shoot, if a professor is doing it and if these students are doing it in Florida and if their friends in Pennsylvania and New York are doing it and their friends in Germany are doing it in Sweden, uh, just listing all places we've been the past few years been pushing the developed world solution of small biodiversity, then maybe I'll do it too. Um, but more important than that is empowering people who have life tested these things out of necessity and supporting them and giving them the resources to continue their research and innovation because that's where innovation is really taking place. I'm sorry, it's not often really in the labs and in the universities where there's nice benchtop models that make fancy graphs, but we've tried to scale up a lot of the work done in engineering departments and found that it doesn't work out in the field. I hope that answers the question somewhat. Yes, I think that's great, TH. Another thing to point out is maybe if we're talking about technological solutions, but if we're talking about other practices, then people in other parts of the world have a lot to teach us in terms of not wasting resources, in terms of utilizing every bit of food, recycling, repurposing. So sometimes we need to reframe that question in terms of what can they teach us, not how we can empower them or really both things are happening at the same time. I think our next question should be directed to yoga because the Clio Institute is so diverse in what it offers. So the question is, what similarities between barriers can we see between facing COVID-19 and overcoming it and overcoming the barriers to climate change. So what kind of similarities do we see in these challenges, these massive challenges facing us right now? Because I think there are a lot of similarities. Joka, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I think, you know, there are a lot of um, similarities and parallels with both crises. And I think the most important one that, um, that I think it's so relevant to the climate crisis is that, you know, 
if we don't leave, if you don't if we don't let science guide our um response um and if our response is not urgent then and i think that's something very relevant that uh for both crisis um like i said in my intro you know we're seeing politicians acting uh, because of scientists um, are guiding them um, on, on what they need to do. Whereas um, it, the same thing has happened with the climate crisis, yet it has gotten on deaf, you know, has uh, gotten to deaf ears. I think the major difference is that, you know, COVID-19 has not had uh, major um, interests um, that or conflicted interests like the climate crisis has. Obviously, the fossil fuel industry has spent um, decades on misinformation um, campaigns, and I think that's probably you know the biggest distinction. Um, so that's number one. And number two, I think, is that you know we that taking drastic measures um, and making sacrifices really can save people's lives. Um, and I think that is something that we're seeing with our response to COVID-19 that we also need to, um, you know, reflect upon so we can address properly the climate crisis. Uh, so though I would think those are the most common ones uh, or, or more or the most uh, relevant ones to, to what we're seeing with regards to action or inaction with, with regards to both crises. Yes, absolutely. And as an anthropologist, I see one of the main hurdles being human behavior is so difficult to change human behavior. And Laura pointed out something that human story is one of the most powerful tools that we have. If you think about the testimonial that happened in front of Congress, yes, politicians on both sides of the aisle debate, but we have those testimonials, those personal stories that sometimes really sway people. So I think it's really thinking fundamentally about human behavior and how do we reach people to get them to understand that physical distancing is what we need to slow this virus down or changing some of our habits is what we need to slow down the effects of climate change. So that's just my anthropological hat coming on for a moment. And I have a, a follow up yeah, follow-up question for you, Yoka. Someone else posted that the Clio Institute and also our climate are nonpartisan and you're both advocating voting as a very important mechanism for people to follow, but how do you navigate that balance? And I think Laura spoke a little bit to that before. Clio, I mean, the Clio Institute sort of in that situation too. So Yoka, how do you navigate that balance between promoting voting and being nonpartisan, but trying to wrap our heads around climate change? That's a great question. And it's something that we deal on a daily basis. Um, we, uh, we we, first of all, we, we sit with everybody at the table, uh, whether, you know, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, our purpose is to really make sure that people understand the science, um, the impacts of the solution. So we work with, um, you know, with both members um, of the parties and um, Laura spoke about the recent um, climate uh, bill that passed uh, at the Florida legislature, which actually we worked really hard with. Um, with Alupes, the Republican uh, sponsor of the bill, um, to educate him in some of the components of sea level rise. So that's where the you know that's where education plays a huge component because when people really understand, um, we and that's why I believe so 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 much in, in what we do is that when people understand the complexity of the climate crisis and they see a path forward and they see there are solutions. Um, you barely get any skepticism or you barely get any pushback. Um, and, and so we try to come with grounded that science information. We only use a respectful um, international, um, you know, well-known scientific organizations for our presentations and for our reports. Um, and, and we just come with that approach. And I think um, that has been very successful for us. Now we are, as a 501c3, allowed a, a very percentage of our budget to do a little bit of lobbying, um, and so we 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 keep that um, budget for you know important uh, legislature um, legislation that we want to push, um, and also working with our um, lawyers and accountant councils and and registering all the hours that you know we use for that purpose.
to to have a 501c3 to maintaining our 501c3 status. Yes, absolutely. That is very important. And I'm toss one final question out, and any of our panelists can answer this one. How important are individual solutions versus structural or large scale solutions? So, if any of you would like to chime in on that one, what are your thoughts? I guess I can speak to that a little bit. Um, if you can you hear me okay? Yes, we do. Yes, okay. we can hear you just fine. So if you see the, the image that I've uh, replaced my face with, it shows my wife who's Palestinian from a small village in the West Bank uh, and a Jordanian um, research assistant at the Israeli Arava Institute of the Environment and myself doing a workshop near Bethlehem a couple of years ago making the pickle barrel digester. And I showed in my presentation another woman with a pickle barrel digester who I've never met. I found her on the web today teaching pickle barrel digesters all over Palestine. I don't know if she was at our workshop a couple of years ago or not, but I'm noticing that the meme is being picked up. And so if we look at um, at this, this uh, drawdown here in the drawdown book, the latest uh, web edition, Biogas for Cooking, where they talk about the amount of tons of CO2 offset, and they talk about the cost benefit analysis. It's all there, but it probably it alienates people to think that the solution is, uh, is building biodigesters, but the local solution that transmits rapidly to get to people is a transformation in the way that we look at so-called waste, which is why at PCGS, we have a course called Waste Not, Want Not, Reconsidering Refuse as Resource. And here you see in this picture above my face, if you've enlarged my face thing, because I kind of a presentation um, using a different software, uh, I'm carrying in, in Tanzania in the left top at Mount Everest Base Camp uh, in the two right-hand pictures, there's Mount Everest in the, ba in the background, and in Kenya in the school kids of Maasai, I'm walking around with incinerator food grinders, everything and the kitchen sink is what I'll bring out into the field to show them that the mere act of grinding one's waste, whether it's organic waste, which then goes into the compost or goes into the biodigester, or it's grinding up plastic using a precious plastic shredder, which we're getting here at Rosebud soon and which uh, Tosin who's online with us has in this conference has been uh, championing for UPSD is when you grind something up, and let me go to just another slide here. There's a, a, a fella in Botswana carrying one of the food grinders that I uh, introduced to his community uh, as he walks to his home past the elephants there. So that's kind of cool. The lengths that people will go to in order to, um, in order to make this manifest, once they see something differently, is a game changer. And then they put pressure as uh, as the Nigerians I visited did on former President Obasanjo, who invited me to live in his house for two weeks, the former three time president, and I gifted him with incinerators. And then he had me do speeches in the churches and universities and schools. This major politician from Nigeria said, well, darn, if I knew that grinding was the key to sustainable development, then I would have put public policy behind this while I was president. So a lot of politicians I've met and I've been talking to people uh, when I was in Damascus and Syria and Iraq, wherever the State Department has sent me, the politicians are asking, give me a tangible solution. Don't give me pie in the sky. Don't give me some, uh, some 10 point plan that'll take years. What can we start with? And that's why Yoka and I, I think both have been emphasizing as, as you have too, Brooke and all of our students and Lara, food waste, food waste, food waste. You can do it and let's get that done. And when people say, well, we can't do all of it uh, because we can't have biodigesters or compost piles, my neighborhood association won't let me, the homeowners association. We did tests in Botswana, in, in uh, Portugal, in Germany, and in Florida and New York, where we showed that if you grind up food and simply dump it on the yard, it doesn't smell, it doesn't attract vermin, it doesn't cause any problem, and it turns into soil in three to six days under normal conditions. And we were doing that in the slums and the favelas of, of Brazil as well, where they just had flower pots. They didn't have, it was all concrete, but we ground up the food and simply dumped it on the flower pot. 
mimicking nature's processes. So I think when I'm talking local, I try to get intensely local and go, are we dealing with the, the low hanging fruit right now? Because if we're not even doing that and we go and we wave banners and we march and we say something, and then a politician or a business can say, hey, hey, wait a minute, did you drive here using fossil fuels? Did you fly here using fossil fuels? Aren't you dependent on the deliveries of food using fossil ah, fuels? Sounds to me like you're a hypocrite, that you're a pie in the sky dreamer. And I'd rather that we all get punchy and go, well, we did eliminate 100% of our food and organic and toilet waste, turning them from problems into solutions. And now we can move on to other things with the same zeal because we've liked this. Oh, sorry, that was my rant. Thank you, TH. A lot of good, a lot of good stuff in there. So I think that one of our big solutions is addressing food waste, which is not food waste at all, but food resource. As I'm thinking about how I'll report back tomorrow to the national group. And I just wanted to say a few things as we're winding down here and going to, to end, which is that we need to think about food waste more than ever, because what did everyone just do? They stockpiled. They bought too much and I'm already putting my hands up going, oh no, all this food's gonna go in the trash. So we need to mobilize neighborhood composting stations, biodigesters if we can. We need to let people know that there are make soil drop-off sites all across the country and all across the state of Florida and all across the city of Tampa. Where if you feel you don't have a place to compost, you can take that food waste. But I think we really need to start mobilizing by neighborhoods in Florida and, and really every state. So food waste is at the top of the list. So make sure that those of you who participated with us today got onto the chat and listed some other big solutions that you see out there so I can report those back tomorrow. So I think that we're going to end here, but we want to continue the discussions over email through the Facebook group through having you come to some of our other events at USF or anywhere in the state of Florida that climate change events and sustainability events are happening. So I wanted to give a little round of applause to all of our participants and panelists. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Yoka. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, TH. We're so glad that we have you in our state. And we will continue working on our database of organizations across the state so thank you, Franklin and Tosin, for helping to run the chat feed tonight, and my husband, Jack, who collated the questions. And I will be downloading the chat so we have that document as our time here together, and we can use that to go forward. So unless we have any final comments from any of our panelists, I think we're going to bid adieu to each other for the evening. Any final thoughts, Laura, Yoka? Let's keep the conversation going. Uh, let's let's go to the Facebook group. Let's keep the conversation going. Let's do more webinars. Um, stay in touch. Follow us on social media. Um, I look forward to connecting with all of you. And let's do this. We can do this. We can do this. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you all soon. That was cool, Brooke. Yeah, that was great. Thank you all. And I think the technology more or less worked and we could hear you all and the PowerPoint worked. So yeah, so we're getting good at this. We're gonna do a whole bunch more of these. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. I see Jennifer just posted and yeah, that was awesome. So I'm gonna make sure I download all of these chats before I leave the screen here. So we have that for posterity. Oh. Good work. Good work. It was exciting. I'm, I'm going to sign off and I'll, I'll send you an email. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Thank nice. you. So thanks, much. Peter. All right. Bye, guys. Bye bye.